Well, good evening and it's a pleasure and a privilege to be able to preach God's word again. This is where... Tonight's sermon will be concerning faith and its results, its effect on the Christian. How faith in Christ and reflection upon his grace manifests itself in the life of a true believer. Before we go any further, we'll turn our time to prayer. Father God in heaven, we give you thanks and praise, Lord, that you have called us, Lord. You have elected us. We are to make that calling and election sure. But Lord, we recognize that there is no strength in us to do any of the things that constitute making our calling and election sure. We have no virtue. We have no righteousness, we are not godly, and we do not have brotherly kindness, apart from the grace that you work in our souls. And it's these things that you call us to do, but Lord, I'm thankful that your word is so full of promises, great, exceeding great and precious promises, Lord. And you tell us also that all things that pertain unto life and godliness that are given unto us, we already have the things that we need because of thy grace I pray for a fresh anointing of your spirit Lord that I might bring these thoughts to my brethren and, and indeed to myself and I pray Lord that you would cause us to affirm these things constantly that we might be careful to maintain good works Lord, we thank you we ask you to just, Lord, fill us with your spirit and make these things effectual. For without thee, we can do nothing. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, tonight's message is called That Thou Affirm Constantly. The title is taken from Titus chapter 3, ver verse 8, but that will not be our main text. The main text that we shall be considering will be in Second Peter chapter 1 uh, chapter 1 verses 1 to 15 in particular i want to focus us on verses 9 and verses 12 to 15 but we'll consider the whole chapter just to see what it was that um, that peter how he structured his understanding of these things his priorities his understanding so we will read the text first and then we will consider the verses. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Saviour Jesus Christ. Grace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore the rather, brethren, be, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle, to stir up to stir you up by putting you in, in remembrance. Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. Even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. 
Moreover, I will endeavour that ye that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. So, verses 1 to 3, I've given this, um, this section a, a overall title, The Centrality of God, Our Foundation. The main purpose for which I'm preaching this particular message is that those of you who know me the longest know me know the best that I am I very very tend towards doubt because I see so much sin in me and being that as human beings we are natural Pelagians those who look to our own works our own righteousness our own virtues and when we don't see anything in ourselves we despair so what do we do we invent religions we invent the Pelagian understanding of the gospel the Roman Catholic understanding which is centered on you, not Jesus, not God, you. We invent Islam and Judaism. We invent all these systems that talk about your righteousness and focus you upon yourself. It's not that we should not look to be more righteous, but our foundation so often is different from Peter's. If you look at it, you'll see Peter's very reason for writing. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. Now, we remember that in, in the Gospel of John, you needn't turn to it, chapter 15, verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. And listen to this. And ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. Christ chose everything. He chose Paul, uh, he chose Paul and he chose Peter. He chose all of the apostles. He even chose his own betrayer. He chose you. And that's Peter, that's where Peter starts. He reminds us of his calling and election. And his audience, Peter's audience, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us. How did we obtain faith? There are many who say, we came, we conjured up in ourselves the ability to believe, the disposition to believe. But we know that's not true. If we believe what the scripture says, we know that faith is a gift. Ephesians 2 verse 8 For by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God Not just faith there are those who say okay maybe faith is a gift but you have to exercise it even that is given to you Philippians 1 verse 29 says For it is given unto you in the behalf of Christ not only to believe but also to suffer for his sake Right there in that verse, Paul tells us that to believe, the active verb of believing, that is given to you. That is granted unto you. So it's nothing that you did to them that have obtained like precious faith with us. So just to remind you, the centrality of God is Peter's foundation. It ought to be ours. And next we have divine righteousness, the means of our salvation. And he says in our text, through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We know that it's not our own righteousness. A few of us were unfortunate enough to be set upon by Pelagians who came over from the States to preach a false gospel. And I was told outright, I have to muster up righteousness within myself or I will never make it to heaven. A man does not know Christ, for he does not see what a wretch he is. But thanks be to God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And divine knowledge as the means of blessing. In our text it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and our Saviour. Of God and of Jesus our Lord. So he's saying, his benediction is centered on the knowledge of God. Grace be to you through knowledge, knowledge of Christ. That is essentially this, the main point of the message that will be brought out in verse 9. If you forget, you will lack. You will lack the graces that should mark a Christian's life. And as and next in our text, divine power, the root of our fruit. 
according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Again we see it. He gave us what we need. I wonder what the Pelagian man would do with those verses. He must twist them to make them say what they don't say. Because we are given by him, not ourselves, all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Whatever is required is given. Or else this rebuke in 1 Corinthians 4, 7 doesn't make any sense. For, he, who, for who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory? As if thou hadst not received it. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. So whether it be things that pertain to life and godliness, it was given to you. Whether it be faith, it was given to you. Or the act of believing, given to you. Now that is where Peter starts. But how often is it? Well, the entire human race starts with his own righteousness. And so often you're drawn back to it like, like the natural plagian that you are. But we are called to, trans be, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. So let us with Peter acknowledge that the foundation of all righteousness, whether it be your impu the imputed righteousness of Christ or your practical outworking of that, it's all centered and founded upon the righteousness of God, the graciousness of God. All of it is of God. We will be briefly considering verses 5 to 7, which are filled with imperatives, but that's so often what your mind will snap to. I know that's true of me, and I know that's true of some of you who, whom I've talked to about these things. But remember, if ever you want to cultivate righteousness, let it not be for the purpose of validating your own faith so much as realizing that all the foundation of the believer, positionally and practically, is God, God's grace and his righteousness. Now God's grace to us, verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now, I'm not going to cover this verse too much, I just want to say partakers by promise, not by work. Now, our duty to God in response, verses 5 to 7. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. The flesh is naturally opposite to this, this particular precept. We won't believe sometimes until we have virtue. That's faith in self. We, t we like to take it not as add to your faith virtue, but cultivate some virtue before you would dare say you have faith in Christ. We know that faith without works is dead, but James did not say that works quicken dead faith. Faith is the foundation even in that epistle. James's very convicting epistle that convicts the lazy, self-centered Christian Faith first, then works. So, giving all diligence adds to your faith, virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. Uh, of knowledge, Matthew Poole reckons this as spiritual prudence or practical knowledge of the will of God. And to knowledge, temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, charity. Now, a number of messages could easily be formed on that small passage alone. But again, my purpose here tonight is to talk about grace. Because that's Peter's foundation. He did not get to verses 5 to 7 right away. He laid a firm foundation of grace. So, we'll be moving on and considering other things. The condition and consequence of fruitfulness, verse 8. The condition. For if these things be in you and abound. And the consequence. They make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now the main verse in this 
text that I want to consider is verse 9. The crux of the matter. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. And that's quite a statement. It's, it's a bold statement that no one, no one would dare to make. No one here anyway unless it were written in the Bible. Now this has to be considered in distinction from 1 John verse three, uh, chapter 3 verses 6 and 9 which state plainly that if anyone is continuing in sin he does not know God. If God's seed remains in you, if his spirit is in you, if you're born of the spirit, you don't continue in sin. So Peter is considering a different subject. First John, of course, was written that ye may know that you have eternal life. So he would distinguish you from a false believer. Someone who names the name of Christ but has none of the fruit. He was distinguishing two groups of people. Peter here is clearly talking about someone who is a Christian, but spiritually cold at the moment. If you lack these things, things like virtue, godliness and charity, but nevertheless you are a believer, you are someone who doesn't rely on yourself but on Christ, the only reason, according to Peter, is that, that you lack any of these things is because you have forgotten something. The foundation of your faith has been forgotten. And you have started to look perhaps to yourself. Because I know that the believer cannot enjoy sin. And so if he's looking elsewhere from the cross, he's looking to his own failings, his own lack of these virtues. But he has not remembered, focused upon, meditated upon, this crucial point. He that lacketh these things has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. This is, so to speak, a, a fork between a, a holier life and an unholier life of a, of a true Christian. I just want to turn our attention to Romans chapter 6. You might turn there, but I want to consider a number of verses briefly. I won't so much cover these verses, I just want to read them to remind you. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall, also, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified, or according to Martin Lloyd-Jones, the better rendering is has been. It's in the past. You have been crucified. Um, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is freed for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he, believe, in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. And these next four verses are the most important ones I wanted to call your attention to here. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. That word reckon that means account, regard yourself treat yourself as if you are and it's not pretend that you are dead to sin he said that your old man has been crucified now if you would say well crucifixion takes a long time Remember that he's saying that what has happened to Christ has happened to you. So in that he is dead to sin, so are you. In that he died, you died also. For that is his entire argument from Romans 5 verse 12 right up to here. His entire argument is so in Adam, so also in Christ. And being that you are in Christ, what has happened to him has happened to you. So it's not pretend that you're dead unto sin. It is reckon yourself, regard yourself, account yourself acknowledge yourself to be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord if you forget these things you will not live holy I'm convinced that Satan will do everything in his power to encourage the piety of, of, of his religions his man centered religions but everything in his power to discourage your piety he'll build up the holiness of someone who doesn't know Christ but those who do 
He'll do everything in his power to make you live unholy. So you have to remember these things. That you are dead to sin. Even having freshly committed a sin. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. That you should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law. But under grace. Now. <clears throat> this is an implied promise isn't it. When you think about it. Verse 9. To read it again in, in, in 2 Peter 1. He that lacketh these things. Is blind and cannot see afar off. And hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. There's an implied promise there. That if you the believer. If you. You are remembering, focusing upon, meditating upon these things. Namely and chiefly, first and foremost, God's grace to you. God's the center, God being the center of your salvation, his, your, your foundation, the rock of your salvation. If you are remembering these things and meditating upon these things, you shall not lack the virtues that follow. You shall walk in newness of life. Sin shall not have dominion over you, because you are not under the law, but under grace. It's an implied promise. And a wonderful promise. You could call it an exceeding great and precious promise, even though it's only by implication in the text. But verse 10. Um, contrasting command unto assurance. There's a contrast there. There are people who forget. But he says, wherefore the rather, or preferably, instead, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. There's a number of important things in our text here. One, our natural Pelagianism, our knee-jerk reaction that does not understand properly the things of grace, will go, oh, much things to do. And, and then you, you'll make yourself cumbered about with much serving and forget to sit at Christ's feet. As you'll become a Martha instead of a Mary. I hope I have that the right way around. Um, and you will forget... But listen to what he says. Give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Give diligence to make it assured that you have been called and elected. That's, so in other words, clarify the grace of God in you. Grace not works first and foremost. It also militates against a sort of hyper-Calvinistic mindset. Oh, I have to wait upon God before I will do anything. There's a truth to that. But the people who persist in saying that are the people he leaves for the longest lingering in their own sin. So do. Do something. Are you struggling? Are you upset? Are you burdened by your own sin? Don't remain in it. You don't have to. If you're truly a, per a child of God, you don't have to remain in sin. Why? You're not under the law, but under grace. You have, by God's command, you, you are commanded by Paul, the inspired apostle, to regard yourself as dead unto sin. So you don't have to walk along in sin. But you have to understand, that no matter how you will be unsuccessful in doing these things, in giving all diligence and adding to your faith virtue, your, your virtues are never going to satisfy you, are they? I mean, if they could satisfy you, well, there would be something wrong with your soul. The Pelagian I mentioned, I, he, he said, so are you telling me you've sinned today? And I said, are you telling me you haven't? And he said, not even close. That's when I realized that conversation was over. I tried, but I realized this man doesn't understand. This man actually thinks of himself as a righteous man. If your virtues are satisfactory to your soul, if you're satisfied that you're virtuous enough, you want to really question your soul. For it is the universal experience of all true believers. We depend upon Christ. That's what the word believe means in its full. Depend in faith. Pistuo. We pistuo upon Christ. We rely upon him and depend upon him purely because he is worthy, he is able, he is sufficient. And we are none of those things. And if you, if you don't know that, you cannot rely on Christ because you're still self-reliant. So 
Do take heart if you are convicted of your lack of virtue. Do take heart because no true Christian is anything but convicted of his lack of virtue. That's not to say remain walking in your lack of virtue. You can always improve. But your foundation must be grace. You must remember these things or you will lack the virtues. And add to your faith virtue. Not virtue. To you. Add to your faith virtue. Do not do it the opposite way around. Do not start with your virtues in order to earn the right to have faith or to say you have faith. That's foolishness, but it's, it's so much what we do. But I want to point out also, our calling and election. Our works are never separated from that. Turn for a moment to Titus chapter 3, verses 4 to 8. Titus chapter 3, verses 4 to 8. We're going to hear the word works at the very end of verse 8. Listen to his foundation. In verses 1 to 3, he doesn't tell, indeed tell us to, believe, to do certain things, to behave in a certain way. In verse 3, though, he recaps about who we were. Foolish, disobedient, deceived, just hateful, horrible people. But verse 4, But after that the kindness and love of God our Saviour toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. So see what he's saying there. He's saying the same thing as Peter. If you forget about God's grace, if you forget the foundation, your, your, the rock of your salvation, the chief cornerstone, if you forget about him, you will lack these things. And what does, that's Peter's take on it. What does Paul say? He says something very similar. These things, I will that you affirm these things constantly so that they which have believed in God, again, he's still centered on faith, might be careful to maintain good works. He's saying what Peter's saying, the result of affirming these things. Free, you see, free grace does not lead us into sin. Anyone who thinks like that, anyone who affirms that, does not know the grace of God, and does not understand the foundation of our faith being grace. It saves us from sin. In fact, is not that what you rely on Jesus to save you from? You rely on him to save you from your sins? You don't love your sin. I know all of you personally. Well, except for our two guests. I don't know you all that well. But the rest of you, I do know that you hate your sin. And I would bet, like me... If God came here and told you that if you just cut off that right hand of yours, you'll never sin again for the rest of your life, you'd do it. It'd be painful, you wouldn't, you'd be a bit apprehensive, but you prefer holiness and you hate sin so much, don't you? I, I hope you do. And we rely on Christ and we are thankful that he has saved us from sin. And is it not one of the most blessed things? Muslim heaven says 72 virgins, an eternity of vice. You don't have to be saved to want that. But our idea of heaven is something that you cannot want unless you're saved. You will never sin again. You will only worship God. And your soul delights in it. Your soul delights in that fact. But these things, the grace of Christ, Paul wills that you, you affirm. Now he, spoke in, he speaks this to Titus, who was the overseer, the bishop of um, the church, or the Cretans. But... Every single quality, bar a few specified ones, that a, an elder is to have, you're to strive to have. Of course, an elder is to be the husband of one wife, and that's not possible for everyone to do here, because some of you are ladies, of course. But, there are, but apart from that, the virtues, the righteous dispositions that a, a, a bishop is required to have, are you not to strive to have also? If he wills that, you, that Titus, or a bishop, if, if Paul would will that our Pastor Mark would affirm these things constantly, then you're not exempt from the duty of affirming these constantly either. 
And as, as it is that our pastor is away this Sunday, we know for a fact that he can't be everywhere at once. It's not his sole responsibility to drill these things into our minds. We will forget, so we need constant remembrance and we need to remind each other. And furthermore, we need to remind ourselves. Martin Luther is reported to have preached the gospel to himself daily. I don't know how true that necessarily is, but it's not a bad practice by any stretch of the imagination. I will that thou affirm these things constantly to each other, to your minister, and to yourself. For if you forget these things, you will not live holy. You will lack virtue. You will... You know what else you'll do? And this is one thing that true Christians hate. You will live a bad testimony in front of men and they will take your lack of righteousness as an excuse to blaspheme the name of your God. And that's one thing that hurts a Christian, isn't it? And the devil does use that. Oh, look at what you just did. Look at what you just did in front of your co-workers. You're, you're not really a Christian if you, if, you, if you go on like that. Having the name of God blasphemed in front of others. No. If we want to live a holy life, which we do, affirm these things constantly. Verse 11. God's chartered course to heaven. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. That word so, of course, it means in this manner. For in this manner. And what is he saying there? In this manner. He's referring to the previous verse. Make a calling and election, sure. If ye do these things. And that's a reference to verse 5 to 7. If ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so, in this manner, in the manner of making your calling and election sure, and striving after righteousness, I'm not here saying we don't have to strive here. We do have to strive. And in this manner, an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly. This is God's designed entrance, His God, God's designed pathway. All the paths are, of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep His covenant. Psalm 25 verse 10. Now, the last heading of our message will be considering verses 12 to 15. And I've titled this whole section, Peter's Ceaseless Zeal to Put Us in Remembrance. In verse 12, we have a growing em emphasis so important to the Apostle. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. We must emulate the Apostle here because we are prone to forgetting these things. We know it's, it's been said of our church and they're right, there's not enough love here. And it grieves us because we do believe, brethren, in this church that we are holding to as much truth as we are convicted of. We want to live holy lives. Without this foundation, we will not do it. With this foundation, according to verse 9, you absolutely will. Unless you, you're actually a reprobate. The grace of Christ meditated upon cannot help but bring forth holiness. So Peter, listen to what he says. I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things. Though ye know them and be established in the present truth. Isn't that amazing? You know these things. And if I ask any of you, to tell me how a person is saved and how a person is sanctified, you'll most likely give me the right answer, I hope. You know these things. These doctrines are pretty solid in your mind. But you see, these are the doctrines of God. We can learn them. But our hearts still have sin in them. And what does sin do? Sin is self-centered. It's one of its main characteristics. Being self-centered, we'll focus on ourselves. But that's just our reaction, our knee-jerk reaction. And that won't end until we're dead. That's why Peter was so diligent to remind you. And listen what else he says. It's a lifelong duty. Yea, I think it meet or fitting or suitable. As long as I am in this tabernacle to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. It will not do to fulfill this duty for a season. You have to understand that the only reason why I need to remind you and why I need to remind myself is because you're prone to forgetting. It's a marathon. It's a marathon indeed. A marathon 
it only ends the end. It doesn't end when you've just done, you know, a mile or a lap. You have to keep going until the end. And this is how it's run. You need to remind, be remem reminded constantly of grace. It is our foundation. He that lacks these things has forgotten that he is purged from his old sins. Stage one is to remember that you were purged from your old sins. You're dead to sin. Regard yourself as that. Account yourself to be dead to sin. Now listen to this. Paul, uh, Peter preparing to die well in edifying his brethren. This is quite an attitude. It's, it's quite, a, quite an attitude. I, I hope to cultivate it in myself and uh, that we'd all help to cultivate this in one another because this is amazing. Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. What he wanted to do with his life. He wanted to live and to preach in such a way that you'd be trained so well that even after he died, he could be sure that you would constantly remind yourselves and each other that you may be able after my decease. What mark do we want to leave on our church? We know that... Uh, we're not like Peter. We weren't told specific, any specifics at all by God about how we're going to die. And we have no idea when we're going to die. And, you know, we, most of us here are very, very young. We have not, death by old age is a long, long way off for us. We have, but we know we could die tomorrow. So what have you done? What are you doing that emulates Peter in this? I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, to have these things always in remembrance. He wanted his brethren to be holy. And the chief cornerstone and the foundation, everything to do with your holiness is given to you by God and you have to remember that. So, for closing thoughts, I've written a small, very small uh, few words, but I also want to quote Charles Spurgeon and C.T. Studd. Forgetting the, gra the grace of God will cause a cold heart towards God and then a slackening of holiness. Meditating. Meditating upon the grace of God, we will not lack the virtues whereunto we are called. These things, the grace of God first and our duties to him in return, I will that thou affirm constantly to each other, to your own selves, to your minister that we might live for the glory of God in full assurance of faith. And Charles Spurgeon said in one of his recent meditations, I can't remember, morning or evening, why should souls who are quickened with Jesus wear the grave clothes of, worldly, of worldliness and unbelief? Rise, for the Lord is risen. And C.T. Studd, a missionary to India, China and Africa, who gave his life a living sacrifice, said, if Jesus Christ be God and died for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. Amen. Closing prayer. Gracious and heavenly Father, we thank and we praise you. You have convicted us of our sin and so often, Lord, that causes us to despair because we see when we look inside nothing of any virtue, no godliness, no charity, none of the things whereunto we are called. I'm thankful, Lord, that I'm reminded that you would not have needed to have instructed us in these things if the new birth alone was sufficient to make us walk therein. We have to be reminded constantly. I pray, Lord, therefore, against the devil, against our own flesh, that we would remind each other, that we would seek to preach these things to one another and to ourselves, constantly remembering the grace of God. We desire to live holy. We would give our right hands, our right eyes, our right feet. If only that would render us holy. We long after heaven and one of the main reasons, Lord, it's not because you've given us streets of gold and pearly gates. It's because, Lord, we love your law. 
we love you, Lord, but we so often do not act like it. We so often yield to sin and we long to be rid of this burden. We long to be rid of sinfulness. And I pray, therefore, Lord, and, and that we might glorify your name. That, Lord, you would cause us to look to the cross. That sin might be put away from us. We know that we have posi positional righteousness, but... Lord, make that be a practical righteousness, an outworked righteousness, where the, the world may only speak evil of us if they are lying through their teeth, not using our impiety as an excuse to blaspheme you. May we never be their excuse. May we, Lord, glorify you, letting our light so shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. Lord, without you we can do nothing. I know that if your hand is taken up off me, I will wake up tomorrow after this message or before I even step off this pulpit and begin to look to myself. Focus our eyes upon you, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, we bless you, we praise you, and we thank you for the temporal graces that we're about to receive. In Jesus' name, amen.